So my name is Colette Hawkins. By background, I'm a palliative medicine consultant, and I've worked as a clinical consultant for about 16 years in the northeast of England. Um, I have been very interested in patient experience, what, what it's like for people living with illness, and um, did a piece of work with Macmillan Cancer Support looking at cachexia, which is the extreme weight loss that people can get with um, serious illness. Um, and it was very interesting for me because I thought I listened to people already, um, but it was my first real recognition that actually I wasn't properly listening. Um, so that got me really interested in experience and also what it is about um, the professional that means that sometimes they're not listening properly. Um, so that was my first insight. I'm also very interested in teaching, and I love to teach, but um, recognised that I was sort of being wheeled out um, a few times a year to do the one-hour lecture on end-of-life care for everybody, and you know, just think, happy to do it, but I don't think it makes any difference. Um, so I decided um, in 2015 that I either needed to just get on with the day job and stop complaining and to give up the idea of more creative and more... Um, purposeful education um, and exploring patient experience, or I took the plunge and did something a little bit different. So, being a risk averse person, it was a bit un unlikely, but I took the plunge. I, I left my clinical post and I'm now working uh, with an academic focus and I develop education. And I'm going to show you some of that and see what you think of it. Uh, and I'm also doing bits and pieces of research around patient experience. At the moment, the project I'm involved with with St Oswald's Hospice in Newcastle is looking at legal issues that people live with, um, and we're developing an education programme around that. So I've also worked with um, the Story of Faith programme I'm going to be showing you is through Health Education England in the, this region, which is northeastern Cumbria, uh, and they're obviously they have a very um, important strategic role in terms of local workforce development, uh, and they've been a great help to me actually. Um, so, there we go. so in terms of my agenda for being here, I'm very grateful for the slot. I was saying to Chris earlier that I wasn't entirely sure what I was going to discuss with you, but so I come with a little bit of an open mind. Um, for myself, it's been um, one area of interest is around um, what it means to be a professional and the impact of an individual professional on what happens to people on the receiving end of care. Sorry, care. Uh, so I come with interest in some clinical experience. I'm not somebody who's got a lot of research in this area. Um, so I'm wanting to engage with you in discussion, sharing experience, and possibly considering you know, whether there are opportunities for the future in terms of building ideas for research. <clears throat> in terms of what I'm going to cover, I'm going to give you a brief summary. This might answer your question in terms of how things have changed. It probably will be not very much, actually. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to give you a foundation for what the standards are in terms of what's expected of end-of-life care in this country. And by way of definition, end-of-life care strategically means the last 12 months of life, as far as you can predict that. So just so that you're aware of that, that it's actually probably a longer time than people may, may think, but strategically we're talking about the 12 months of life. As well as the standards, I'm just going to show you a little bit about where we actually are and then look at what lies beneath that. Um, and finally finish up with a little bit of stuff around an educational approach. I'm going to, I've got three stories to show you of slightly different types. Um, I use these now for teaching. Um, I'd be very interested to see what you think. One of the things that is really important is that they are real and they are emotional because they're people telling their experience. And that's part of the point. Um, a lot of what we do is very sterile but this is about emotion and what it really feels like. So they're quite powerful, um, and they can affect you in ways that maybe you, you don't anticipate. So it's really important that you know, we're, we're all here to learn, but we're here as people as well. It's absolutely fine if people want to disengage in any way at any point, so either in the room or out <coughs> With the stories, what I do um, in terms of the healthcare and social care teaching that I do is show the stories and then ask a couple of reflective questions and I ask people to just talk in small groups and then we feed back together. Uh, it's a, this is an experiment because I've never done it in a non-clinical environment but I don't see any reason why we wouldn't get some really good discussion. So I'm wondering whether you'd be happy to do that. 
you can give it a try and see. Yeah. Um, I'll just give you a few minutes after each story with some specified questions, just talk with your neighbour, and then we'll throw ideas around after that, and just see what comes. So I'm going to go straight in with one of the stories, um, and you can probably tell from the title that it's um, a challenging story, but it's told from the perspective of a palliative care nurse, but she's describing a very personal experience when her mum was diagnosed with a terminal illness. So I will take that off for a minute and show you the story and see what you think. Is that okay for the screen? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, great, thank you. I was with my mum, waiting to see the consultant my mum, the psychiatric nurse, but she was frightened. The lung cancer specialist nurse slithered into the room just ahead of us. Oh shit, I thought, this is not good. The registrar gave my mum the bad news, which she handled very well, with compassion. Mum had lung cancer, and it had already spread to her ribs, but I knew in that instant it had also spread to her brain. My mum, the communicator, was having difficulty communicating. We were plunged into a whirlpool of investigations intended to find out exactly what kind of lung cancer mum had so they could treat it appropriately. This drove them. I knew it was futile. Mum knew it was futile. The brain mets were the enemy and we were past treatment. She needed symptom control and palliative care. She was labelled a lung cancer patient and the consultant was keeping hold of her. No one ever asked my mum what she wanted, yet she knew what was wrong with her and she was the expert on herself. No one ever asked me either, yet I was a palliative care nurse. And in the middle of the madness and the maelstrom of investigations, we went home and it was then she said, all hope's gone. My mum, dynamic, full of life, hilariously funny, astute and a culper. My mum taught me the importance of listening to patients and picking out what was important to them, yet nobody bothered to do that for her. I felt completely helpless and hopeless. I knew what was coming and it would be horrendous. Valuable time was lost because they didn't listen to us. They didn't even ask us. Her main problem was back pain, but they did nothing about that. They just followed the plan. She died seven weeks after diagnosis, in pain. She had terminal agitation from the brain mets and was tormented by a fractured spine. Thank God for the hospice who helped me care for her. If anyone had asked my mum what she wanted, if anyone had listened to her answers, if anyone had ever seen her as a whole person, the outcome would have been the same, but the journey may have been very different. talking to somebody next to you. Firstly, how do you feel? One of the things we, we recognise is that people are very quick to think and analyse and often criticise, but we're encouraging people to just notice how you feel watching a story. And also, I'd be interested to know what you think about what that story says to you about fresh approaches to people who may die. What, anything that stands out for you. So we're just going to be a couple of minutes and then we'll see what you come up with. Would that be all right? I felt what you in the story. Sad. Yeah. Sad, 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 sad. For any particular reason, what was something to stand out? Uh, the, the sadness, the sadness that uh, they were not listened to. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, and, and that's the thing, you know, we look at facts, it's easy, and in uh, different compartments. Yes, not the whole. Thing. Yes, very much so, yes. Um, Labels. Exactly, so it's, uh, yeah, I feel the plan, and mm -hmm. it's one of the things that I'd, I'll come back again at, towards the end about uh, the sort of algorithmic approach, um, because I think it's good in a way that there's standardised approaches, and if you come in with a pneumonia, then mm -hmm. you expect X and Y to happen, yeah. and there's yeah. a drug for mm -hmm. that. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. Th it's important there is an algorithmic approach, but the worry is that that then compromises actually listening to people and doing something that's person-centred. Mm -hmm. And they're not, they don't need to be mutually exclusive, but sometimes they seem to be. Mm -hmm. And that's what I wonder whether, I don't know, but I would assume, you would think that they would have asked, mm -hmm. wouldn't you? They would have explained that there was pain. It, it doesn't seem But I suppose it was such a, a fast diagnosis in yes, terms of yeah. Yeah. It was very the numbness and just that people always think they've got more time or yeah. I don't know, they're trying to sort their thoughts out about yes. what's, yeah. what should they be focusing on. Yeah. Um, and just because they're professional, of course, doesn't mean that they don't behave like anybody else. It, it's so wrong, isn't it? It's yeah, like, exactly. You know, and I think they can make it worse. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 what's going mm. And I think yeah. Yeah, from, from you know, speaking to doctors and nurses in particular who are on the receiving end of care, they often don't want to be treated any differently, you know, on an assumption that, well, actually, I don't need to tell you this because you already know. Mm -hmm. And people don't appreciate that because they want to be treated like anybody else on the assumption that everything's gone yeah. and it's all a muddle. And it's, and it's asking, see, because I've met uh, Kate Granger's husband. Oh, yes, and yes. And she's very powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Chris. Chris, yeah, yeah. Point of, yeah. Uh, just about on how to speak to people or, you know, the girl with the isn't it? Whatever. Yes, yes. Yeah, that was, yep. uh, and that, they were sort of colleagues as well. They've sort of, but um, I just think it's, the, in terms of the clinicians, and I know, that, I know quite a lot, they've got such a huge caseload, and I think in terms of managing it, they probably can't, haven't got the time yeah. or resources to be yeah. able to look at the person holistically, um, and sometimes it might be the and specialist nurse that might do more of the sort of the day to day hand holding and what yeah. have you got. But I also almost have a feeling in that sense with the professional, if I approach it, if I approach the disease instead of the person, I can just say, where am I in the face and, and where in the process and where in the process, what tells me what I then have to do. If I have, if I approach the person, then it suddenly becomes less clear what I need to do because then I suddenly have to deal with all those emotions. And then, of course, with a caseload, that makes it all complicated. Let me please just focus on what I, I know. Mm -hmm. uh, are you in stage three? I do this and this and this. Oh, you are moving up to stage four. Now I do this and this and this. And it's, of course, then almost, I feel at that moment, also a matter of it's almost protecting myself as a clinician. Like, otherwise, I have to do with all those feelings. And in 10 minutes' time, I have a new patient coming in with another thing. And I have to so it's also that involvement that I think is, is very difficult. Almost a self-protection. That, uh, that, and that's essentially the essence of what I've come to talk about because I think that's probably very much evident mm. across the workforce. Mm -hmm. um, and there is a real issue of time and pressure, absolutely. But as long as you stick to a clinical decision-making model and don't engage the patient too much, you're in control. And you can keep it to four minutes, five minutes, whatever you've got. But it's completely at odds with the principles that we're now supposed to work to, um, which are very appropriate principles. And I also agree that it, with what you were saying about self-protection. Yeah. So I'll come back to that as well. I think that's very relevant, and that's one of my questions, really. How much is that happening, and are we, are we doing that? For, is that okay that that's happening? Because of what's happened for people on the receiving end. Yeah. I find it very interesting at the end, you said, but in the hospice, yeah. It was all different. And of course it's such a different environment. Yeah. It's you you can't compare yeah. You can't com of course we do. But but you can't. It's yeah. It's it's a challenge that, isn't it? Because yeah. hospices are wonderful in what they do, mm. but mm. they data wise, they care for about five percent of people at end of life. Yes. It's a tiny minority. Yes. Yeah. Um, which is great for that five percent, but mm. it's the ninety five percent that And they're usually the complicated 
complex ones, yeah. aren't they? That yeah. get to hospice really the, Absolutely. the ones that are yes. more manageable. If they can be managed somewhere else, they yes. could be managed. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And I also question what we were just talking about, I also question the difference in the context where death is in a sense within the hospital environment is a defeat. Yes. You are defeated, you have lost. Yes. Yeah. But death in a hospice mm -hmm. is one of the elements that you deal with and talk about. Well, in the, hosp in the hospital, of course, you are so trained on healing people, so you look towards the aspect which extra th therapy I can put and give to this person to maybe have a slight impact. Because, of course, it's then very difficult. And then the, the person says, I know what's coming, but I want to... We have, of course, in the conversation with the people that we meet in the church, when then a person says, listen, you know what, I want to have some quality of life, so please stop the treatment. Just help me to deal with the pain, but I don't want the treatment. You see the devastation. We have seen the devastation on the face of the clinician who says, but there's still so many other things I can try, I can do. Mm -hmm. No, I feel that I'm, I'm in the face. I don't want to disrupt the quality, little bit of quality that I still have. Okay, it's a couple of months less, but now at least in my full sense, I can enjoy my grandchildren, my children, and, please, and then of course within the hospital context, it's seen as a defeat death. But in the hospice context, it's something I deal with yeah. and talk about. Yeah. Absolutely. The second story is very much around that, actually. It'd be very interesting to see what you make of that one, around how we make mm -hmm. decisions and, and exactly that, the sense of uh, you've got to keep going. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, thank you for those comments. You're a lot more animated than the clinicians, I have to say. <laughs> um, <laughs> They're probably stoned, I think. <laughs> <laughs> They're probably also thinking, actually, yeah, I've... I've done that all the time. Yeah, I've done that. That's been my clinic this morning or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so I just wanted to give you a quick context in terms of standards of care. Um, it wasn't until the end of life care strategy appeared in around, two, well, it was 2008. That was really the first time that there was any focus on what end of life care should look like in terms of what people can expect. Um, and they, they gave this quote in that. How we care for the dying is an indication of how we care for all sick and vulnerable people. It's a measure of society as a whole, and it's a litmus test for health and social care services. So they're basically putting the spotlight on it, saying, yeah, this is really important. It was great in many ways, because finally it was seen to be a really important area of care. Um, it's a document that basically shows the utopia of end-of-life care, very aspirational. Um, and ultimately, they were saying end of life care should be equitable, accessible, and high quality. Goes without saying, really. But also, regardless of place of care and diagnosis, because you'll probably be aware that even in specialist palliative care services now, 80 to 90 percent of the caseload is people with cancer. And the, the way people approach a cancer diagnosis is very different from the way people approach patients with chronic pulmonary disease or heart failure who have equally troublesome symptoms, equally burdensome mm. uh, life issues uh, and psychosocial disturbance. So there, there's, their need is no different, mm. um, but this is what's happening and it's still happening. Um, and they identified lots of things to change and lots of things to aspire to, but they basically whittled it down to people don't die when they want to die. Um, we're not doing very well for the people who are dying now, but we need to be prepared for that size of population to go up, and it's going to go up a lot. And also, not everyone receives high quality end of life care. Well, I think that was probably a bit of another statement, actually. But <laughs> <laughs> um, so this was our gold standard. And on the back, of, oh, before I do that. Um, one of the things just to say as an aside really, it's probably very obvious, but we've already mentioned about hospices caring for the minority. The majority of end of life care is undertaken by the wide health and social care workforce. It's not a specialty, it's everybody's job. Um, and what that means then is that everybody working in health and social care is likely to have something to do with somebody who has a terminal illness <coughs> or is bereaved. And that means that we need the wide workforce to have some competencies. And it's things like recognising somebody may be dying, the easiest they can tell often, good communication skills, compassionate care, whatever that might mean. And it's business about <coughs> patient at the centre of decision making as principle of shared decision making rather than a paternalistic approach. We're meant to work across teams and providers seamlessly, um, meant to have boundaries for ourselves. 
practicing within the law, again, sounds obvious, but that story is a particularly good one, actually, the one we've just seen, <coughs> for raising the question of whether the Mental Capacity Act, which is law, was breached in that lady's case. It's a bit of a grey one, but arguably, this was a lady with capacity, and she wasn't asked what her views were, so arguably it was breached. And that is happening all the time. So we're probably not practicing within the law reliably. Holistic care, the sense of what we talked talking earlier about the bigger picture. And obviously you need to know some stuff, it may just be a bit of awareness, things like advanced care planning, which is a national agenda now. Um, but that's a big ask of the wide health and social care workforce. And when you stop and really think about it, it can be a little bit overwhelming. And then on the back of the strategy came a number of national reports which are looking at, okay, we've got this approach, this is the standard that we should be set to you, where are you? Um, and it would be no surprise to you to know that the Peter reports are flat concerns. Uh, and the sorts of um, themes that have come out about recognising people are dying, we're not doing that very well, communication's an issue, we're not working in teams, we're not coordinated, and we don't offer enough choice and individualised care. And this was some of the stuff that came out of the Neuberger Liverpool Care Pathway report. Things like staff not being open that somebody may be dying. The people going onto the Liverpool Care Pathway without honest discussion about actually this maybe and that was intended for the last three days of life. So people weren't even being honest at that point. Um, inappropriate conversations, perhaps very rushed, treatment decisions without agreement. Um, and the quote I was mentioning. Um, I came across the other day, it's somebody called Dr. Bernard Lone, who was Emeritus Professor of Cardiology at Harvard and a Nobel Prize winner for his part in, I think, for his part in um, cardioversion uh, defibrillators. And at 96 he was a patient and was quoted as saying, I always was the last to know what exactly was going on and my opinion barely mattered. Yeah. Well, it goes back to, if, you know, if somebody like that can't be heard, mm -hmm. oh, what hope is there? So, a lot to improve on. Um, and I could have picked the Daily Mail, actually, for this, but I've picked a couple of more, like, more credible reports. <laughs> um, so, in 2015, there were a couple of um, important uh, statement things that came out. Health Select Committee saying the experience that people approaching the end of life have varied, and in too many cases is unacceptably poor. And then dying without dignity, which says a lot itself. Uh, end of life care is sadly a recurring and consistent theme in our casework. We see tragic cases where people's suffering could have been avoided or lessened with the right care and treatment as they approach the end of their lives. The anguish that this causes them and their loved ones is unimaginable. So this is really important stuff that we're not doing very well. So. My next question, to move on to the next bit, is so what lies beneath? We know what we should be doing, we've got the standards. We ha it's poor reading, it's grim reading in terms of where we are. So why is it going wrong? What's, what's wrong? We've got a couple of slides on this. The first one is the going into the shelf of this is a little bit too difficult. And this is about the way services are structured. I'm a believer in pick your battles. Um, and this is the reality of delivering end-of-life care. There are multiple professionals involved, and that may be great. It may be really useful that the specialist physio is coming to help with mobility issues, the dietitian's involved, giving advice about supplement drinks, the doctor's looking at the prescriptions and symptom management, district nurses looking at the dressing, and that's great, because everybody has their expertise. But they're often working across different organisations, across health and social care, and you could start to see the problems. Because I think people talk about com complex patients. Well, isn't the patient being complex? Absolutely. <laughs> it's the system, the system that's complex. Absolutely. Yeah. And that is absolutely right. So if you, if you badge patients as complex, probably 95% of them would fall into that category. With comorbidities and various things. Yes. And you, you know, put this in the mix, and, and it all starts to untangle. So we talked about the big picture. And of course, if, if you've got all of these professionals, and I, I have counted up to 16 professionals, which as I say, is great in many ways, that you're getting holistic approaches, but nobody sees the whole of the person. And the worry with that is that the patient care priorities may be missed, because everybody's coming with their professional agenda, I'm here to review the drugs, we'll do that, and then off I go. 
Another aspect that came home to me rather abruptly a couple of years ago, I was talking to a dementia specialist nurse who works in the same area as me, and she was telling me about various services that they have to support people living with dementia. I knew nothing about them. So there was nobody that I was involved with who was being, who was being referred to that service by me because I didn't know it existed. And services keep changing. They're constantly evolving. Some of them come, some go. Keeping up to date with them is difficult. Uh, so patients miss out sometimes. With the best will in the world, with all of these people, it's difficult to be coordinated. And ultimately, there's a sense of, is anybody actually in charge here? Is everybody just doing their little bit? And if we don't know, we sure as hell the patient and carer don't know. So, but I'm going to put that on one side because I think that's probably going to be something I can't particularly change. But what I want to talk about is the individual professional because I think that is a real opportunity to um, look at are there opportunities for it improving. And we all know that if we go to the GP or whoever it may be that you're seeing professionally as a patient, that the outcome for you, the experience, will be different depending on who you see. And that goes without saying. Some of that is about the professional training and education. Have I seen this rush before? Oh yeah, I remember that. Or, I'm sorry, I'm not very good at dermatology. You better see somebody else. So that will play its part. Um, and also, you know, confidence. How, how confident are you in this, in, in this encounter? But is there more? And of course there's more. And I want to illustrate that with something that may be very interesting for you, which is that spiritual care towards end of life. And this is something I think says a lot for me. Um, because there's evidence to show or to suggest that clinical staff feel unable and or unwilling to discuss spiritual care wishes at any point in a pe person's journey, illness journey. Um, and the Liverpool Care Pathway, although it is no more, was a fantastic resource actually. Um, yeah, really good. And what happened to it also says a lot. But in terms of what it was intended to do, it was intended to support people who might not be doing end of life care day to day uh, and was prompting to think about things proactively and holistically. And one area of um, baseline assessment when people went onto the Liverpool Care Pathway was about spiritual wishes. Um, and did people have, had that been addressed, so it was a tick box exercise for the staff, have you, have you spoken to the patient about whether their spiritual and or religious wishes? Um, have you done that with the carer as well? And if so, what have you learned? Um, so it was very prompted. You didn't need any particular expertise for that. Um, but what was becoming very apparent was that of all the sections in the Liverpool Care Pathway, that was the one that was being missed out. Everything else would be filled in and this particular section would be blank. And North Tees and Hartlepool mm -hmm. took the ball by the horns and said there's a problem here and had a look at their LCPs and found that only 4% of people on the LCP had a documented spiritual care wish. Um, it doesn't mean to say it didn't happen, of course, but it wasn't documented. And it's a tick box exercise and everything else would be filled in. So it suggests that there's a problem there what is it about spiritual care wishes that means that people won't engage in that? So they went one step further and said, OK, we're going to assume that the ward staff are actually a little bit challenged by this issue. So we're not going to ask the ward staff to ask on our behalf. We're going to go and ask ourselves. So the chaplaincy team went to everybody who was on the LCP and asked permission themselves. So they consented themselves. And I did the Liverpool as well. I did the Liverpool the same thing. Oh, really? Yes, yes yeah, yeah. They, they appointed me uh, as the spiritual care um, uh, worker. And uh, because of that title, I could go in any room uh, yeah. and introduce myself and just have this chat from, you know, how are you? And uh, is there anything you believe in? Is there, you know, the wishes? Of course, you build up a relationship also with the, uh, with the family and, and all of that. I even became part of the uh, multidisciplinary team because of my role. Because I could say, well, I had information. The other doctors didn't have that. They yeah, did yeah. all their part. Absolutely. And, but, but they missed the human. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, and yeah. So, so, so th that, that's what worked. Yeah. 
LGBT. Yeah, and I, I, its loss was a travesty um, in many ways. Mm. But in doing this opt-out model, I think contrary to everybody's or the sort of award-based stuff, they didn't expect this to happen. Only three percent of people said no thanks. Mm. Um, and I just think that the worry is that there's probably a large number of people who are not even having the opportunity to express what they would want. Um, and in my view, that says more about the professionals than about people on the receiving end of care. And therein lies a real concern. Um, coincidentally, the trust saw a reduction in end of life complaints. Now, it may or may not be related, but you know, make of that what you will. Um, it was a real insight into the fact that perhaps the professionals were obstructing whole person care. So, Claire, yes. just in terms of because some trusts have uh, the chat when, when certain anticipatory medicines are prescribed, mm -hmm. that flags to various people, including yeah. chaplaincy, doesn't it? In well, trust. I think it's variable, yes. Um, and I, I just wondered how you felt about that because sometimes. I think my, my colleagues in other trusts would say they turned up on the ward and actually the patient didn't even know that they were at the end of life or that the anticipatory oh. Oh, or the yeah, yeah. anticipatory yeah. meds had been yeah. prescribed yeah. and it's quite often it was Friday afternoon, junior doctor covering those yes. sort of things really, so yeah. it's, a, it's a tricky well, one. Well, I, I think as a, part, as a member of the multi-professional team, the chaplaincy team, the chaplaincy are fantastic because exactly as you say, they, they come with a different agenda, a different perspective, and they bring something really important to the clinical care team. Um, however, I certainly agree that people shouldn't, no member of staff should be asked to go and see a patient who hasn't been pre-warned of what's happening to them um, we used to find this quite a lot as, as palliative care team members that we would be asked to go and see somebody. And your badge says Macmillan, or my badge says Macmillan. And we would usually, well, we got into the habit of saying, do they know what's wrong with them? Have you told them? Yes, we've told them. And you still turn up. And actually, I suppose it's worth mentioning that what is told somebody is not necessarily the same as what they've heard. Mm -hmm. So somebody may say, yeah, we've told them their diagnosis, and they may have done but that person may still not have taken it on board. And sometimes they say that you need to have it here at least yes, four times exactly, as well. Yeah. But I, I, th I think people are thrown if they don't feel that they've had some degree of awareness of where they are in the disease journey. So I, I, I feel that people should, there should be honest conversations. If, if it's a clinical services, you're thinking actually this person may be towards end of life. That's exactly what that thing said about the LCP. Conversations are not honest enough with patients before we pull other people in, and that can throw everything out. And people then lose trust, because I think yeah. they, they recognize that you're not being straight with them. So, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's just, because we don't do it in our trust, so, but I know what I should do, and I was just, yeah, so I am um, um, come to a conclusion, yeah. Yes. Where that is. Yeah, I don't think we should spring things on people. Um, but I, I think the North Teeth model is great, uh, personally, uh, partly because the, there was an annual review of the Liverpool Care Path, an audit, a national audit, and where I worked at County Durham Darlington, we, we were finding um, large proportions of LCPs not filled in in the spiritual care section as well. So I know from my practice, my, my local area, that, that we were in the same boat. Um, and it was interesting to hear the conversations with management about, okay, so can we do the North Tees model here then, please? This is what they found, this is their data. Oh my goodness. You know, it was ridiculous. And issues about confidentiality, and could the chaplains have information, could, could they have access to this information? So we're part of the multi-professional team, why not? Oh, you just, oh, just frustrating. Anyway, I'm going to uh, thank you for the, all those comments. It's really interesting to hear all the different perspectives. I'm going to go on to a second story. This is a guy called Atul Gawandi. Has anybody oh, yeah. heard of Atul Gawandi? 
I've been given before about patient wishes. So yeah. there was the chocolate ice cream and, and uh, football. Um, the general, the the academic guy, and what, what his daughter was wondering what he'd want, and she had all these ideas about what he might want, and actually just wanted to have chocolate ice cream and watch the football, <laughs> essentially. Yeah. Okay. Well, well this is this guy's an American surgeon, and um, of all people, he was somebody you wouldn't necessarily think would view things like this, but he's fantastic and he's inspirational. Um, and he likes to reflect on what's happening in terms of the minds of clinicians. So this is a really <clears throat> One of the reasons I write is it be my chance to dive into problems that I'm very confused about. I've written about, you know, what are we supposed to do about the cost of healthcare? Why is the malpractice system so crazy? What's the way it should be? written about why do we itch <laughs> you know it's confusing and interesting to me writing is my way of diving in and figuring out what to at least think about it and this was one of the big ones the two big unfixables are aging and dying you know they're not you can't fix things we're afraid of talking to the patient about these problems as well a lot of doctors feel like I, I know how to have this conversation. I know exactly what I'm doing. But what I knew, what I could see over and over again, was that we weren't particularly good at handling people going through the last phase of their life. I've had to learn that because of patients with whom, you know, they did not end up with a good experience at all. And then I had to learn it the hard way because of my dad. Do you remember when um, Dad first started to get pain in his neck? He thought I was playing too much tennis or this muscle. And instead, what they found was a, a tumor, um, a huge tumor. I remember I took notes in my journal around that time. This is my dad saying, the way things are going, I could be bedridden in a few months. The tumor had extended into his midbrain. The, the suggestion was that we should go see what options there might be for chemotherapy. So the oncologist lays out not eight or nine different options, and we're swimming in all of it, and it's all my thin Christine, thin blast. And my dad says, well, what if I don't take any? And she said, well, that's your choice. Then started talking about how, you know, you really should think about taking the chemotherapy who knows, you could be playing tennis by the end of the summer. I mean, that was crazy. It made me very mad. <laughs> because it was I mean, completely not like it, yeah. You know, this guy is potentially within weeks to be, of being paralyzed. It was holding out a hope that was not a realistic hope in order to get him to take the chemotherapy. Uh, when he made the final decision that he doesn't even want to, I told him, for me it's okay if you have paralyzed, so what? I can take care of you. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that, that's the main difference. It was not fine for him. The oncologist was being totally human. And, and the oncologist was talking to my dad the way that I have been talking to my patients for 10 years. But hope is not a plan. In fact, we find from our trials that we are literally inflicting therapies on people that shorten their lives and increase their suffering out of an inability to come to good decisions. Barely mentioned spiritual care, but in, 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 in being mortal, but it's throughout the whole it doesn't mention it specifically, but in terms of holistic care, yeah. patient-centered patient care is just yeah. throughout the, the book, isn't it? Absolutely. I, I think it's so insightful what he says. <clears throat> um, and I, I'll not get you to talking groups because I'm just conscious of the time, but anybody care to say how they feel watching that? I thought it was very honest. Yeah. All, all about the fact how he, he recognised and realised how he had been dealing with himself yeah. as a clinician. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I found it really honest. Very self-aware, isn't he? Yeah. 
yeah. and beautiful this morning. What I found really beautiful, and again, it shows me the power of journaling, mm -hmm. the fact that he was now sitting down with his mom mm -hmm. and could look back, not only like all memory, I think that that was said, but he could literally like, yes. oh, he said that and that, and that was said, said to us, yeah. how did that make us feel? Yeah. So I thought it beautiful that this interaction with his mom yeah. linked to the journal that could really give the facts back and then together talk about feeling. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's an incredibly honest person. In fact, I saw another of his videos just recently, which was when, when he was talking with um, the husband of a young lady who died. A very difficult situation because she just had a baby. And he was reflecting back with the husband about why he lied. And he wow. actually used that word. Wow. Yeah, to the husband. And they had a discussion about it. I thought, whoa, God, that's so brave. But it was lovely to see two human beings being human together, mm. being really honest with each other. And there was no, uh, there was a joke about you could have lost your license for that or something like that. But um, I think the, the fact that he was that mm. honest was incredibly powerful, vulnerable, of yeah. course. Um, I'm just interested to, to have a sense, of, from your perspective, what, why do you think the oncologist might have been driving this chemotherapy? I mean, you don't know, we, we will never know, but what sort of things might drive the oncologist to say, oh, well, you've got a choice, but actually, this is what you should really think about. Maybe something like, I've tried everything. This thing of, this is one of the, the things that I know best, mm -hmm. that it has sometimes some impact. So, let me keep trying, and I can, for, for my own conscious, can say, I've tried everything. Yes, yeah, I, I think that's almost certainly in there. I suppose also from the clinician's point of view, if, it, if you extend life by a month or two or three months, that's a partial success. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> very, very important point, yeah. because then it comes back down. Uh, Statistically. Like, yes, whose goal is that? Mm -hmm. yeah, so, to make them feel better. Yes. Actually. Absolutely. Because I'm, I can actually do something yep. rather than just yeah. saying... And perhaps even to avoid their own existential dread, I mean, yes. without wishing to overstate yeah. it. I mean, if you're faced with someone who's basically embracing suicide in, in some senses um, that's a terrifying thing yeah. to have to process whether you're a professional or not and if you're brought up in or you know taught in a culture and I do think medicine has this kind of distinctive culture when it comes to death mm. um, that says we try everything until until yes. we run out of options yes. then of course your immediate reaction to that kind of existential crisis is going to be to do something and yes. some people are just doers when they're faced with problems and maybe that's absolutely. true of doctors. And I, I th absolutely, I think that's very much how medical training defines you, mm. you know, you are a fixer mm -hmm. um, and therefore comes back down to this sense of you failed. Yeah. Yeah. Because in that of course we can very easily from this very sterile surroundings here, mm. just in that sense, but of course we are, we are all motivated for trying wanting to help somebody. Yes. We, we, yes. we are very, because it's still, when you have a conversation with somebody, still I have to force myself at a moments, I just have to listen. Yeah. I cannot offer a solution. Yeah. And then of course, so next to the natural human drive to want to help, to bring a solution, on top of that being trained, yes. I can bring a solution, that, that I can heal people, that's the reason why I'm here. Yeah. It must be an incredibly difficult thing, and maybe it's even from his point, of, his or her point of view, from the clinician, even if I bring something, at least I bring something, I do something for this person. Yeah, and it's such a strong driving force, that, yes. really. The, the bit that he said at the end about we're inflicting things on people that do them harm, essentially, mm -hmm. that, I, that, that's at the point where I think we need to stop and think, is this, is this right? Oh. Uh, and is there something that we should be doing differently to acknowledge that that happens? And that it's a human response, um, but is there a better way? Mm. So, okay, well, thank you for those comments. I'm going to just move on. Uh, one other thing that um, uh, he mentioned, this was in a paper that he wrote at Old Wendy. He was reflecting back on when he was a junior doctor, and he was asked to go and take consent from a, a patient, a man who had advanced prostate cancer, with widely metastatic disease and he had a, a spinal met that was pressing on his spinal cord um, and things that are slightly different in America because they do tend to push more in terms of active treatment but very much a, a palliative situation and he was asked to go and get consent for spinal decompression surgery um, and he reflects back on getting this consent and the patient then having the operation 
and he says that the patient chose badly, not because of all the dangers, but because the operation didn't stand a chance of giving him what he really wanted, his continence, his strength, the life he'd previously known. He was pursuing little more than a fantasy at the risk of a prolonged and terrible death, which was precisely what he got. Mm. He then died about two weeks after the operation, after a very stormy cause. But he then says, we could never bring ourselves to discuss the larger truth about his condition or the ultimate limits of our capabilities, let alone what might matter most to him as he, as he knew the end of his life. If he was pursuing a delusion, so will we. But interesting, again, um, and I, I really relate to this. I think this is probably a lot more prominent than we realize. And I'm very grateful to him for being able to sort of put it out there and say, this is me, this is what I think. Uh, and I, I, think he, I think he's doing great things. So doctors as humans, well, certainly we feel good if we can fix. I think anybody does, but that's certainly how we're trained, yeah. Um, but it goes back to a point that was made earlier. We, well, what you said, Jane, uh, patient survival may not be their priority. We make an assumption that it is. Um, and we bring our own agenda to this principle of shared decision making, but sometimes who is it that we're treating? Are we actually making ourselves feel better? So individuality certainly does have an impact because it, we know that it can impact on what we choose to discuss with people, like spiritual care, how we discuss it, and the way a decision is formulated. So ultimately it has a massive impact on what happens to people receiving end of care. So just going on to education, the challenge is that we can, we can deliver care with knowledge and skills. We can train people, give them information, and they can go and care. But if you're going to deliver the type of care we're talking about, you don't just need knowledge. You need an approach, at, uh, attitudes and behaviours, things like being self-aware, being respectful, uh, having resilience, all those sorts of things. And that's the links to that slide I showed you at the beginning that we're expecting the wider workforce to have. And the flip side to compassionate care, of course, is that you make yourself a little bit vulnerable. And if we've got time, I'll just finish it off with that. But how do we teach? And certainly in terms of the way medical teaching happens, it is almost always in professional silos, often in classrooms, and usually focused on facts and skills. Um, and it's driven by the professional agenda, and there's a curriculum with a tick box that says, I can work as part of a team, tick. I can break bad news, tick. Uh, and that's literally what happens. Um, and the issue that I have with it is, and that's, there's a place for that, that is important, but it's sterile and it's removed from uh, the reality of end of life care, which is messy. Okay. And ultimately, therefore, it risks not changing practice. So I have been very interested in a different way. Um, so here's a gap. You can give people as much knowledge as you like. It doesn't necessarily mean I'll push it into practice. And what you need is a bridge. And I just wonder whether using stories and engaging people on an emotional level and looking at the broader context of what matters to people, whether you can start really unpicking what person-centered compassionate care looks like and actually start to reduce this paternalistic approach and, and equalize professionals and patients a little bit better. Um, so the, the stories-based program which you're experiencing um, has been supported by Health Education England um, in this region. And what I've developed is a learning resource based on stories around end-of-life care. Um, and in creating the digital stories, we got stories from professional providers and some informal caregivers. And we analysed them for themes, and the common themes were communication, right up there, shared decision-making, particularly around people feeling either empowered or disempowered. Planning care in advance, which is a national agenda now. Holistic care. The experience of informal carers, a massive issue that often gets overlooked. Effective interprofessional, and the one that I'm particularly focusing on now, which is professional as a person, which I, I think is just sort of mushroom in terms of where it might go. What we've learned from developing the programme is that professionals want to tell their own story. And a lot of professional providers actually show themselves and their humanity uh, and what's brought them to where they are now as a professional. Um, and there really is a very significant blurring between the professional provider and the patient on the receiving end of care because actually a lot of the time it's one and the same. 
there has been really positive engagement, really encouraging engagement with this sort of learning because people are not used to having the opportunity to talk about how they feel and the, the broader aspects of care delivery and the challenges and things that upset me or that I can't cope with. Um, so people are really engaging with that, which is great. What we don't know is if it makes any difference. So there's me saying, you know, the current model of learning doesn't change practice. We don't know. Something I would be interested to do is incredibly difficult to demonstrate whether an educational intervention changes and it, And it's if you get in the right people to the session, because often yeah. you get the people yeah. that, yeah. Yeah. you know, the last one I've seen, the last teaching we did with the senior commission, sort of level like four teaching, it was all people, on that, you know, they're yeah. all good people and engaged yeah. and what have you, and then you're thinking, I never see so and so. Yeah. They've never come to that. Yes. Um, so it's trying to, how do you get to those people that probably need it yeah. more? Yes, absolutely. It's usually the people who need it who think they don't. Exactly. Yes. Um, ultimately, I suspect that there, there may be a stick tag approach. And um, interestingly, um, about a year ago, I think it was, the GMC brought out a professional competency framework, which has a lot of the attitudes and behaviours that you would expect doctors to have anyway, but they've defined it, and that's really useful. What they haven't specified is what they're going to do with it, um, and they're sort of delegating responsibility for, for how that's then delivered in the curriculums of training um, to professional bodies, Royal Colleges and um, training boards. Um, so it's sort of mixed news, but the good news is that I think there's likely to be a bit of a stick for people who, who don't generally come. It's not there yet, but it is needed. Yeah, I, I had an experience with that as well. I had an opportunity to give a workshop about spiritual, uh, yeah, spiritual care at the end of life for the nurses and the doctors uh, in, in Liverpool. Uh, and because of that, uh, you know, uh, there were a couple of times that I was called in you know, for nurses, for doctors, or they just when they saw me going around from, oh, Angelique, do you have a minute? And, and that, that was, yeah, that was amazing. Uh, because coming from, from, from their point of view, talking about feelings, yeah. you know, that, 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 that's, mm. yeah, that's tricky. Yeah. So, uh, but it's, but it's, yeah, when, when it happens, it's, it's beautiful. And then you, yeah, you can you make that journey, you know, with the professionals as well. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, that, it, 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 I think it, it's on some levels it is happening. But not in a structured way. Yes. And I think you're that's right. What, that's what you're we need. right. And I think when people do engage with it, they really benefit from it and they really yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. There's yeah. a little bit of a sense of bravado, I think, um, and I'm hoping that will change mm. with more modern medical curricula in terms of student learning. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but there's a way to go yet because there's a little bit of. Um, I'm bigger than all of that sort of thing going yeah. on because I am the doctor. Yeah, and then I also can understand it because it's also protecting yourself, yes. isn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. You can't fall apart. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, that's a very good point because yeah. it's interesting you should say that because the last bit that I'm wanting to do, are we okay for time? Uh, yes, we finish overall at six. Yes. Yeah. We want to allow some time for discussion before that. Okay, that's fine. Have right. a discussion along the way. Yes, so. that's fine. Um, well, we're not far off there now, but I thought that's a really important point that you make and it's very valid that in the context of uh, sort of laying professionals bare in, in a way in terms of where we can improve, there are issues around vulnerability which are really important to pull into the equation. So I thought I'd show you one more story if you're up for one more, mm -hmm. okay, um, which is the human cost of caring um, and brings in an important issue about how staff are supported. This is a story, a story told by a paediatric consultant. Somewhere inside a hospital, a child dies. A family goes to pieces. This was unexpected, rapid. She was sick, very sick. An incident form is completed. Level of harm, death. A serious incident, SI. SI investigation, what, why, how, where were mistakes made? Failure to rescue? She'd been with us, the third hospital in a week, for 36 hours. 
In the last 24 hours, she was looked after by eight nurses, 12 doctors, the lab technicians, the porters, the cleaners, the healthcare assistants. 20 of us had seen her, looked after her. I am a specialist. I also saw this patient. I had had a tough week, was exhausted. It was late on a Friday, even later after I found her notes. I had been asked to answer a specific specialist question. I look at absolutely everything, start at the very beginning, take as long as it takes. But for the first time ever, I just answered the specific specialist question after speaking to the parents, examining the child for the specialist symptoms. I then documented and communicated the specialist's answer to one nurse and two doctors. Monday morning, my inbox. An automated incident report email. I was shocked to the core when I learned of her death, which happened eight hours after I saw her. What did I not do? What did I miss? What should I, could I have done? I felt and still feel very guilty. All of us were shocked, felt guilty, so very sad. A patient's unexpected death is hard to accept. A child's unexpected death is very hard to deal with. A debrief meeting, nine doctors attend, two nurses. Within a minute, the nurses leave quietly. Have they got a nursing debrief? We talk openly, some of us cry. We share our feelings, the guilt, the doubts about how we can carry on, the self-criticisms, the what-ifs, the if-onlys and reflections. We help each other, support each other. I do not see the nurses for weeks. Later I learn there was no nursing debrief. The nurses were terrified that the finger of blame would be pointed at them. The coroner concludes that the child was very sick and death was likely inevitable. In medicine, there's never a definite. For the team, what if, what if, what if though, what if? No individual was at fault. Small pieces pieced together. Lessons are identified, addressed, improvements made where improvements needed to be made. The SI is closed. Somewhere in a hospital, a team is in pieces. One doctor is shaken to the core and retires earlier than planned. One nurse leaves the acute wards, she cannot cope with it anymore. One doctor wants to stop being a doctor and nearly does so. It is the fragmentation of care, teams being in pieces, which leads to serious incidents. And serious incidents leave families in pieces, leave caring professionals in pieces. But, somewhere in a hospital, there's a team more aware, working hard together, passionate and caring. There are so many pieces to bring and keep together. So, another very powerful story, that mm. one. Anybody? to say how they feel watching that? Well, there's one question I, I really ask myself here is, one side, what I, I read through it is, we expect this vulnerability from the professional, from the clinician, to really talk as a human being to a human being and have that awareness. But at the same time, we live in a society that is just waiting, and, and you are taught more and more in whatever profession, be careful, protect yourself, have a, the, the paper trail right, etc. Because if anything goes wrong, we don't want the finger, of, as it was, the finger of blame put to us, let alone that we will be sued for, I don't know, enormous way of uh, uh, high prices, high costs. And there's potentially a tick behind my name. And that, of course, is in my feeling counterproductive of asking somebody to be more vulnerable, because I have to protect myself in the case there will be, I will be sued, and we live in a society that is more and more less open to talk about 
how can we improve and what, what, does, what do we feel, then no, no, I just want to run away put the blame to somebody else because then I don't have to think about it, I can blame the other one and then it's over and done with. And it's almost a, a contradiction in itself. Well, of course, this has been in the news recently with Dr. Bauer Gerber um, and exactly that issue. And it's left people feeling incredibly yeah, vulnerable. Yeah. Uh, and what seems to have happened is that by being reflective and honest, she's been absolutely yeah, punished. Yeah. Very much so. Um, and I, I did some uh, teaching with some junior doctors recently, and I, actually before I'd really got to grips with what had happened with that doctor, uh, and talking about reflective practice and how important it was, and they just looked at me and said, we're, we're not going to do that. We're, we're not going to be honest in our reflective practice. Yeah. But because they, 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 but their perception is that they can't. Um, so you're right, it, you, you, they don't, they're completely contradictory, the, the sort of practice that we're trying to have versus the experiences that people are having, if they are honest. And because that means, in, in a sense, then my next question in that sense, then is, is it even possible then to do something in training and education as when the people coming out of that education come to an, an environment mm -hmm. that almost teaches them right away don't, let, don't be open. Yeah. Just put things on paper as you should be, tick the boxes as you should do, because otherwise you will be sued. So, right away what you are taught is almost at the moment you step into the practice of everyday life, it destroys. Yes. I think that's a really important question, and I think it's possible that um, we are where we are and we can't move out of it mm -hmm. unless there's a massive cultural shift. Having said that, though, What's been very interesting from Dr. Bauer Garber's case has been the outpouring of um, emotion from the medical mm -hmm. profession, with so many people saying, that could have been me, that could easily yeah. have been me. Yeah. Um, and there was even a cardiologist, I think, who said, come and, to the GMT, come and look at my practice, because I, I've done that many times, come and have a look, just strike me off if you want. And so there's been that strength of feeling, and I just hope you know, I just mm -hmm. hope something good will come out of that because what's happened to that poor lady has been completely at odds with a, a, a transparent yeah, culture yeah. Uh, and a culture of no blame, which is allegedly what we're in. Yeah. Yeah, be honest, be open. Yes, yeah. with duty of candour, courtesy of mid -stats. I mean, this, in this particular story, um, I mean, surely there are times when people die of things because they're going to die. Yes. Yes. Now, what I wasn't clear about with that child, was she truly going to die despite whatever anybody could do? And if so, there is some kind of myth that doctors are living in and yeah. our culture is mm -hmm. living in yeah. that somehow you go into hospital and you're going to come out. Yes. Yeah. But surely, yes. you know, we are not, uh, we are not immortal. Absolutely. And sometimes, tragically, even yeah. children contract an illness and, and they are going to die. Yeah. Now I know, so what I'm not clear about was, did something go wrong there? Was there some blame? Or was this a genuine case of something that this child contracted that meant she was going to die? Well, my understanding from it is the latter. Yes. That the, the child was, and the coroner's yeah. usually very scrupulous. Yeah, the, the coroner's come up with what the coroner came up with mm. is, yes. is pretty... And they're, they're pretty rigorous, and they, they won't leave stones unturned if they feel that there could have been something that somebody needed to account for. Um, so I'm, I'm sure as I, can, as I can be from the story that mm. that was a child who was going to die. And I think I mean, what you're saying is really important because there's this myth of infallibility. Exactly. Mm. Um, mm. And actually, um, what's it called? Necessary fallibility is, is the term that, that people use because you, you, are, you cannot control everything. Mm -hmm. um, and even with decisions, you, you know, penicillin, you would expect to work in this per person for this particular illness, but you don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. So you have to work with uncertainty, and yet the expectation is that you never get mm -hmm. anything wrong, and that you know everything, and you are infallible. And the, the, the flip side of the doctor's outpouring has been a slightly worrying um, public comments about Dr. Bauer-Garber in terms of would you want that doctor looking after your child? And you can understand where they're coming from, absolutely. But there is not a doctor who has not made a mistake. So 
to just setting, setting up for an impossible... But that's quite different, is it not, from a situation where nobody made any mistakes, there was just nothing they could yes, do. Yes, yes. The expectation, though, is that what you're talking about in terms of the expectation is that you, death you is can. a mistake, exactly. death is a failure. Yeah, it's yeah. not just about mistakes, because the staff expressed it quite well on that. Um, you know, what if? Yeah. You, yeah. Might, you might have made no mistakes, but you still mm -hmm. wonder what if yeah. I've done yeah. things. Or I've done it earlier. Yes, or yes. Or yes. Yeah. Yeah. But there's a societal expectation on doctors, isn't there? Which is yeah. a terribly unfair, because some things we can't do anything yeah. about. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And that's the way it is. Yeah. yeah. And I'm, I, I'm, I don't know whether there's an element of a, a gender, because of the, the she was female, uh, non white, I don't know precisely, but, yeah. non, but I'm just thinking, you know, that's one of my, yeah. my thoughts is, and it's, you know, that seems to be quite common. Yes, that she may yes. have other people. She's been a victim of her own honesty and yeah. trying to be. But I just think white male doctor would they, would he have ended up in the same place? I don't know. Yeah. And I couldn't be. You know what I mean? Interesting question. Absolutely. Yeah. Hmm. Um, it, it's yes, part sir. of the culture, isn't it? The, the Western modern Western culture that really deaths. They're talking about death is really taboo. Mm. Yes. You know, even in a hospital situation, yeah. you don't talk about it. Like you say, everyone's got to be successful at what they're doing. And death is a reality. Mm. And that's sort of not acknowledged yes. really, is it? Mm. Throughout the whole of yeah. our culture. Mm. And, and really. That's the baseline. And, and yeah. given that baseline, it's hard to get anything to work right, isn't it, in terms of communication yeah. and working together with people? It's just not, not mentioned. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is where it's beneficial to work in a hospice because <laughs> no one's trying yes. to avoid the issue. Yeah. And that's actually yeah, that's very, very, very liberating, yeah. in fact, yeah. in a way. It just eases the tension because everybody knows exactly yeah. what's going on. Yeah. It makes you realise what's possible yeah. in the context of somebody yeah. dying. Yeah. 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 But is that discussed in, your, in the doctor's training? You know, the, the fact that death is a reality? You know, life does come to an end. Yeah. More so now than it used to be, but not as much as probably yeah. it needs to be. You think about yeah. It. yeah, yeah. Well, I, th I think people are very aspirational in terms of, I'm going to be a doctor, and um, they find it quite difficult, I think, medical students, to conceive that actually that, that it's okay for somebody to die. Um, I think there's a lot more focus on the medical curriculum now than there used to be. Mm. So hopefully, and going back to the cultural issues, hopefully in time, with better training at, at an early stage, people mm. won't come out and practice as if they're infallible. Mm. Mm. And then when things do go wrong, which almost certainly will happen, and I, I try and tell this to the junior doctors, you know, it's highly unlikely that you're going to go for... If you're doing anything... Years, but, yeah, you, you, absolutely. It's not risk-free, is it? Exactly. Yeah. It, and you are going to be in a situation where you harm somebody and you don't intend to do that. Mm. Um, and if you're not aware that that's going to happen, how can you be prepared for that at all? Um, so you, they, they should have someone available that they can confide in and go and talk to mm. about these yeah. issues. You yeah, yeah. So there should be some... Facility for that yes. for them. And I think that's the sort of thing that really ought to be built into yeah. the way we support staff and students yeah. in training. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. I think that's an opportunity actually because mm. a sense of we don't really need that has pervaded a little bit. But I think we are moving beyond that yeah. actually. That it's okay to yeah. talk about feelings. Yeah. 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 So I'm just going to finish off. Um, so well, we've touched on a lot of this actually. So vulnerability comes from being compassionate, making a mistake, things going wrong, whether you've made a mistake or not. Self-criticism, I think anybody in the caring profession tends to be naturally quite self-critical. Being human, you know, trying to look after people when you've got a splitting headache and you're really tired. And a negative culture, which is still a blame culture despite... And I think we know. always think about the things where, that went wrong. We don't think of the... Yeah. The 99 times where yes. we've done a good job. That, I was sorry, I forgot to mention that with the negative culture. You're, you're likely to know when something's gone wrong, but when do you hear when it's gone well? What a shame. And isn't that a really obvious opportunity for change? Because it's all of us can give positive feedback. And I really want people to do that. because It makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. 
And this has also been mentioned, self-protection. You have to protect yourself. You can't take on everybody's distress and burden. Um, and I think professionals have a varying ways of self-protection, some of them healthy, some of them less healthy. But things like disengagement, the professional mask, behaving like two different people, this algorithmic approach will stick to the, stick to the plan, like um, the first story said, shifting the blame or, or trying to focus on other people so that nobody looks at what we're doing. But an open question. I think then there should be another mm. way. And I'm just going to finish off, and then if there's any final points, feel free to add them up. I feel like I've asked a lot of unanswered questions. Um, but I think I've identified three gaps, and I thought I'd just throw some ideas about closing them. One is strategy versus what's really happening. Some of that, but some of it I think we can influence, and it's about empowerment, and that may be the way we educate. Also, I think there's a real opportunity to empower the people on the receiving end of care. Yeah. I think we underestimate what they want to do for themselves and what they can do for themselves. And we can be quite um, dismissive um, and disempowered without meaning to. So there's a real opportunity there to let people help themselves. And teamwork is something that I think we need to be better at. Some of the stories-based stuff I've done th working with interprofessional teams um, which is a bit of a novel thing to do, and people are, oh, we're really going to learn together. It's been fantastic, and people really bounce ideas off each other and learn from each other. And I think it builds bridges. Second gap is the knowledge practice gap. Well, I think there are ways of improving that, and I'd be interested to know what you think, what you, know, what you make of the stories-based learning, but I think you can get beyond core knowledge, which you can embed in that learning, and look at the broader aspects of care that we all struggle with. Uh, reflective practice we've discussed. I think it remains important what will happen to us, I don't know. But I also think that we tend to teach and then leave people alone. And I just wonder whether there are better ways of engaging people over time. And there are models like communities of practice, and I've got no experience of those at all. But it's sort of intuitive that if you want people's practice to change, you need to work with them over a period of time. And the final one is professional versus patient. And this is about refocusing training, that we are not two different species. We are one and the same, and all professionals are patients at some point as well. So we should change the bias to fixing to healing in its broader context. And the times when you are healing in the context of somebody dying, mm -hmm. or being part of healing rather than necessary healing. Necessary fallibility I've already mentioned, I think that's a really important point. And learning to enjoy working with patients as equal partners rather than being threatened by that. Vulnerability, somehow building that into how we work, um, looking after staff, being better at the challenges and the risks to them and the consequences for them. Uh, and a final question really, is there a place for spiritual care? Because it seems to me that a lot of this is about whole person care of the professional. Um, and a lot of what we do is focus on knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and I just think there's a bigger picture for the professionals as well. So on that note, I'll just take you back to the original question. Uh, and I think it's probably both that we facilitate and we have the capacity to obstruct as well. And what we need to be focusing on is how can professionals be facilitators of good care. So thank you for your comments. Does anybody? Want to throw any other comments out? Well, I, I have a particular issue with all, all healthcare, but especially it would be very, you know, I would be very concerned with this about the use of computers in mm -hmm. medical care. I mean, when you go into the doctors now, uh, there's a computer there that you press to say you're here. You don't speak oh. to the receptionist to say you're necessarily. Oh. <laughs> and the lack of human contact now. You go in to see your GP. A lot of them are just fixed completely. On the screen. The whole thing. Yeah. And I had my research participants say exactly that this morning. Do they? They're yeah. not picking up body language or anything from the patient yeah. at all. And I wonder if that's the deteriorated the human contact. I mean, computers are very good. You could pass information swiftly and save somebody's life. Yeah. 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 But the downside of it is this, this deterioration in human communication. Yeah. That I'm very concerned about that. And I noticed some doctors that like, I, I, 
One doctor I see is completely on the computer, doesn't look at you, and the transformation of another doctor looks straight at you all the time. Yeah. This is basic communication skills, isn't it? <laughs> that is supposed to be part and of training. That, yeah. that time, my blood pressure is just low, low, low. When it says no problem with your blood pressure. Right. But when they're on the computer, it's like... <laughs> uh, yes. Well, you, you're probably very aware that, that there's a, you can use things like that to terminate conversations. Mm. So, and people do that, mm. the professionals mm. will say, that so do need that. Need but, it. But, Chaplains do it, everyone does yeah, it. Yeah, and sometimes you do need that, don't you? But this is very basic communication skills, and that's a real concern if people are not able to use body language appropriately. Because that's basically what you're saying. But they're not interpreting the patients, they forget the skill. Yeah. Because they're looking at the computer yeah. all the time. They yeah. don't exercise the skill, do they? Yeah. I mean, my, my son's a GP, and he said you can tell what what's wrong with a person very often as soon as they come in the door by the look of them and you, you, you can you can yeah. tell just by looking at them because they see so many of the same symptoms yeah and actually guan has got a very good thing about looking at people's feet isn't it about how they walk yes, there's something there's something in yes. being walkable about just looking at how their how game they how they walk well, yes. and just yeah. in terms of assessing their Oh, by just looking, the yeah, when they come in, oh, looking at the feet and how oh, they... Oh, right. Yeah, that's what I meant, I think, that is yeah. sort of thing. Yes, yes, yeah. And you can tell as a patient... They learn from people's gait. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm. If you walk into the GP surgery and they're looking at the computer, you know yes. you're in for a bad ride. Mm. Mm. And probably an unsatisfactory outcome. Right. <laughs> yeah. Any other final comments or...? Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for all your contributions. It's been very interesting to talk to you. Yes. Thank you so much. It has been really engaging. It's very rare that we've had the discussion so well embedded in that. Yeah, that was really good. Oh, you're very welcome. It's very interesting to talk to you. As I said to Chris earlier, it's very nice to have the opportunity to hear other people's worlds because you get so focused on your own. So, yeah, and if anybody feels that they've got burning ideas or opportunities we were talking about the fact that there's lots of really interesting areas that right. overlap spirituality and theology and palliative care um, and I'm really interested in looking to develop research in that area so or, or, and or teaching so um, feel free to get in touch I think my mm -hmm. Harry's you well, can, my contact is on the bio yeah, yeah. Yeah. So anyway. thank you, thank you. Thank you.